I'm here today with Dr. Jen O'Ryan, who is an inclusion, diversity and equity strategist focused on helping people build authentically inclusive and welcoming companies. She combines a PhD in human behaviour with over 20 years experience in leading global launches of new products, policy and consumer experiences, and understands the challenges leaders can face in developing a culture of inclusiveness for employees, clients and customers. She frequently speaks on podcasts, panels, and at events related to inclusion and diversity, organizational behavior, and humaning, which is a great word, by the way. And she's the author of Inclusive AF, a field guide for accidental diversity experts. <laughs> We're going to come to that title in a minute because it is hilarious. <laughs> this, there's so much there. But let's talk about diversity in organizations, particularly, first of all. <sighs> why does it matter and why is it so hard? It's that's such a great question. Um, it, it's it matters because so to give a little context, um, I started my career in tech and it was alarming to me how many decisions were made for these global releases based on six people sitting in a conference room in Seattle. And there's so there's such a lack of perspective and lack of different ideas. And it, it really it's it's having diversity for the sake of bringing all these different lenses and thoughts and worldviews into into the discussion, not just when you say six up... people, you, you mean six white blokes, don't you? E, well, and I was there, so yes, basically yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so that's that's the thing is we need these different perspectives and different worldviews because otherwise we get this myopic, you know, end end product, and it, it just so much is lost. I mean, and not even just about the organization, but as humans being exposed to different life experiences and different things like that is just, it just makes such a better um, journey. And the frustrating thing is that the science shows that, you know, there's so much evidence about how diversity improves bottom line, it improves outcomes, it improves happiness, all this good stuff. So why are people still so resistant? People like change and until it affects them. And that's true across the board. As humans, we like change as long as it's somebody else's change towards adapting to what we're used to. And the thing is, is that um, we we tend to view organizations and structures like that as if they're something of nature, as if that accounting department just developed. It just is a thing like the Grand Canyon, right? And it's not. We're a collection of humans. And so if 2020 has taught us nothing else, it's taught us that we can we can change we can we can do things differently we don't have to do them simply because that's the way it was structured in the 1950s and then we also get into the really squishy idea of what do we mean when we say diverse is it just the observable diversities is it just you know how are we defining that and it's a lot of work um when i go in and sit down with people and, and talk to them about what their organization might need uh it's it, it, people shrink back and they're like, that sounds really expensive. And I'm like, yes, it is. But <laughs> but you're working with humans and, and you need to have space for that. And the expense point is um, is interesting because you have to build a return on investment case for it. And that's hard to do. These are, as you say, they're soft, squishy outcomes. Yeah, yeah. And I, I am a business major and I totally understand wanting to measure things and wanting to have this quantitative understanding. But we're dealing with humans. And so you really, it's really difficult and time consuming to go and understand what's going on in the organization um, and, and understanding what's the lived experience of a person working in a manufacturing floor in a small town versus somebody who is nine to five in the corporate office. Uh, it's just such a different understanding of that. And so it's, it's also, I mean, especially around inclusion, equity, diversity, these conversations can be really emotionally charged. And, and we're peeling back what people have, you know, learned from a very young age about what it means to be this or what it means to be that. And sometimes it's really difficult to even get to why people are resistant to oh, a certain change or a certain introduction or, you know, um, people using pronouns in their auto signature can seem very, very foreign and very like, why are you doing that? And you have to get, you have to peel back the layers and do the work of getting in, into that. And really yeah, that's where they are. Yeah, and that's a really interesting perspective on the change, isn't it? Because change is bad enough, but change at that really fundamental kind of hardwired mm -hmm. values level mm -hmm. is, is mm -hmm. really, yeah, it's really hard to do. What what I yeah. what has changed obviously over the last I don't think ten years or so is 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 the the lip service at least being paid to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you must have come across a lot of rainbow washing uh, in your time. Yes, 
Yes, yes. And the, there's so much of that. And lip service is such a perfect way to describe it because you can't, it typically, when people think about um, promoting their company organization as inclusive, it is all about that. It's, it's the rainbow washing. It's like, you know, June comes around and pride stickers show up on every product. And then you, what happens in July 4th, right? People come back from holiday and it's all forgotten. And to me, I approach it as like, like therapy. And I am a huge proponent of therapy. Everyone should have all the therapy <laughs> and unpack what, what's behind that. But organizations need to start within. They can't, they can't have a recruiting drive. They can't have a marketing slogan. They can't have a catchphrase on their website. They really need to start looking at how are individuals, not just employees, but potential customers and consumers experiencing them as an organization, experiencing them as a brand. Yeah, it all works. And, and I like that point that you made about it. it's just, it's for the people within the organization, it's for the customers, it's, it's that whole stakeholder piece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the uh, one of my favorite examples is the you know if you look at um, launching a product, you start with all the market research and you start with all the what are our competitors doing, what's happening in the industry, and it's this huge, eighteen month long initiative. And if you're not looking at uh, inclusion as um, from a design thinking perspective, then you're something's going to get missed. And I, I've actually seen instances where. Everything was executed beautifully. It launched, it was well received. And then there's a third party app that just a little tiny snippet of the experience, <clears throat> pardon me, that says, um, for whatever reason, they need to identify a gender. And it says male, female, other. Um, all that effort, all that effort of 18 months, and your customer's gonna see that, roll their eyes and and move on with life. You've, you've absolutely lost them. And the thing is that will they'll never know. Mm -hmm. and it's interesting the organization will never know yeah of course because they've just gone yeah and you don't get that feedback you have to build it in and and you obviously work as a very highly trained very experienced consultant and, and you know do, doing stuff with people but you, you you title the book about for the accidental diversity <laughs> expert <laughs> because frankly not every company's got somebody like you have they so I'm assuming that lots of people just end up in that role because everybody else stepped back or you know, they were doing a good job and somebody promoted them to it. And, and there they are going, ah. <laughs> that is That is very beautifully encapsulates exactly most of the journey. <laughs> it is. Uh, and I it would be interesting to see how we spell that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, yeah, we're, we're going to see it on uh, LinkedIn as, a, as an actual job title now. Well, go on. Sorry, I interrupted you. Were you going to say no, no, no. It's so funny because I use that. I use the term "accidental expert." It, it, it comes from a very loving place. It's, it's in a very endearing term because it is that person who is the only one who stepped forward and everyone else stepped back, or it's somebody who's just really passionate about. They see how small incremental changes could make something so much better, and not even necessarily about humaning, right? But the workplace in general. You know, you can you can make small changes that all of a sudden it's contagious and people feel more positive and engaged and seen. And so, yeah, the, typically the accidental experts are either people who are really good at executing and getting things done or they're really passionate about improving something. And, they, and they're willing to just they, they go to sleep thinking about it, wake up thinking about it, and they just drive, 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 drive and find a way around or through the obstacles. And this is for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's that's one of the reasons that I got into this is because I saw a huge gap between, you know, LinkedIn said that uh, in the last year, chief diversity officer was the fastest growing C-suite title. And I no doubt that that is the case, right? But you give me a two or three motivated program managers and we will change the world. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's, it's that... It's that between aspiration and that executive level and the lived experience of the people doing the work, you need to fill that gap and you need to be able to implement safely and effectively. Yeah, I guess in a sense, it needs to be everybody's job title, doesn't it? Exactly, exactly. Let's talk about swearing, shall we? <laughs> 
you did. You, I actually, I literally sprayed tea all over my uh, keyboard when I was, I was reading the book. And you, you mentioned in your acknowledgements your thanks for all the people um, who had put up with your profanities, which were, you said, as prof- what was it, uh, like glitter over a macaroni art project, which was the best simile I've ever heard, hands down, brilliant. And so you're obviously a naturally sweary person. Thanks for holding it in check so far, by the way. And, and that includes. <laughs> Did I'm guessing you had a few debates uh, with the publisher with yourself about the the use of swearing in in the title in the book all that kind of stuff because on the one hand it kind of it, it signals something very strongly there's no messing here you know this is accessible this is down where you are but on the other hand that actually is off putting to some people isn't it so tell, talk me through your your thinking with the whole profanity thing. It is. It is. And honestly, I, so that was the working title for a very long time. And I I was, I was not going to use it, but as I was getting ready to publish, you know, it's 2020, we have all this uncertainty and pandemic and loss and and struggle. And where are we even coming out on this? And every time I hear the title, I swear I can hear my mom saying, Jennifer, what, Um, don't call it that, call it something nice. Call it something nice. Call it something nice. That I can be proud of. (laughs) Right? That she can put and show her bridge partners. My um so my my intention in doing that is that and I did I did get a lot of people who were like, Don't call it that, you will never sell a single copy. And honestly, uh one of the major retailers will not advertise it because of the title. And but I also realized we can't we can't be inclusive, please or inclusive if there's budget, or inclusive if it doesn't make people uncomfortable. We have to be all in on this. We can't we can't sugarcoat it, we can't wait, we can't do assessment evaluations on, on what is the ROI of inclusion. We've gotta be all in. And so this was very precisely targeted as that person who wants to disrupt, who wants to create change, even if they don't have any budget, even if they're just one person. It's like, here's things that you can do when you're standing in line at, 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 a, at a market or at a bank or in your work, or if you're the CEO, here's what you can do. And it really is just that let's scrap all the lip service and, and mottos and catchphrases and let's just really get down to what we need to do. It sort of dictates the tone for the book as well, doesn't it? When you, when you pin your colors to the mast that firmly, uh, and it almost gives you permission to be who you really are, to speak in a really accessible way, to, to not, as you say, sugarcoat things and and not to climb behind a lectern, which is quite often the temptation for, for people who know an awful lot about their subject and, and feel very strongly about it. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And that, that image of a flag is so true, right? It's like you just raise your flag and the people who want you will find you. And the other slide of that is that it's not going to be, you know, performative allies who just want to have an inclusion, equity, and diversity book on their shelf because it, it looks good, but they've never read it. Like this is not going to be that book. <laughs> and and then there will be many of exactly that kind of book in this space. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But this is for about the people who really like want to want to change the world and just really don't know how or where to start. And and actually, one of the things I love about the the book is that it has narratives. I want to talk about those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Let, let's so, go on to those. Because I think okay, it's sorry, really sorry. I don't want to. No, 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 do. It's, it's perfect segue. So, I mean, storytelling obviously is, is you know, something that everybody aspires to be able to do because it communicates so brilliantly. But I love the way that you frame these as narratives. So, yeah, absolutely. Tell us why you chose that that form, how they work, what they're doing in the book. Well, I, I, so I am a huge business book geek, right? I, I love reading business books. You are and, so in the uh, right place. <laughs> right. But I wanted this to be a blend of, we're not just business, this is about humans. And a lot of the people that I talk to and work with, it's not coming from a place of malice, microaggressions, the people, generally speaking, um, it's, they've never had to think about it because they walk through the world very differently. Hmm. And so what I wanted to bring to this practical application roadmap strategy book was, here's why we're doing it, because here's some very personal vignettes about people walking through the world in a way that the person reading it may not have ever had to think about. But you also you also see yourself, at least I see myself in, in almost every aspect of the stories and the narratives just because it's it's a human experience. 
it's such a great use of storytelling that idea of um shifting your perspective and in a sense creating empathy really isn't it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. exactly and then and then it sparks the question well, what else haven't i been thinking about and, you know, when I'm sitting in a conference room with six other people or five other people who are all white men in that certain age group, um, whose perspective isn't being brought? And what else should we think yeah. about? I mean, we, you know, we think about accessibility, but do we think about neurodiverse humans and how yeah. they're interacting with, with the story? Yeah, brilliant. And I want to talk about the writing as well, Jen, because um, it's it's a million miles away from your PhD dissertation, isn't it? Was was that a bit of a culture shock? Yes, it took me years to unlearn writing for an academic audience. Um, my emails would be chunks of text that were very carefully crafted, and people couldn't consume them because really? our, our been created by an artificial intelligence um, bot. <laughs> Exactly. That's how it read. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, it, I mean, when you get to the point that you can write an entire paragraph, but it's one sentence, it takes a while to unlearn that. And so I was actually in a meeting and people were scrolling through their phones and you can kind of see them, you know, scrolling with their thumb. And it clicked for me. It's like they need to be able to get the concept that I'm trying to convey in that space, in whatever space they have available on the top of their phone screen. And, and that's so, way yeah, less than a traditional paragraph. Way less, yeah. And so it was, I just decided to um, write in my voice. So it, the, the book to me reads like you and I are sitting at a coffee shop and you have questions about, you know, you want to work some, through some strategies and I will, it, it's a collaboration and it's a conversation. And that to me is exactly what I wanted to put out in the world. I'm like, if people buy it, fantastic. If one person buys it in, you know, Kansas City, Missouri, and it helps them change their corner of the world, I am done. <laughs> I am done. And the the people who share their stories, those are out into the world, and hopefully those will be consumed by people. Um, and that that really was the tone and the message that I wanted to I wanted to convey. What was the lived experience of that? So you're you're writing in a completely different way, in a way that you've had to almost unlearn everything you knew and give yourself permission to do it differently. I mean, I guess that's quite energizing, but also it's, make, it's quite vulnerable making, isn't it? Did, did you enjoy it? What, what, what was going through your head as you were doing it? I, I enjoyed it tremendously once I leaned into the fact that this is going out into the world and not everyone's going to love it. Not if you know, people will be, you know, as you, as you mentioned, people might be put off by the title. They might be put off by, you know, some of the cultural references and social references that I put in there. But for the people who really need it, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be accessible for them. Do and you yeah, remember was, that moment? That that coming to terms moment. Was there a sort of shift in you when you went, actually, this is what it is and that's okay? Uh, and, and you know, what happened around that? Oh, that's such a good question. I actually I do, weirdly. Um, because it was I have spent so much of my career and and most people do right who who work for companies uh creating things for other people Mm. and and filtering my thoughts and my voice and what i want to do in the world through the lens or the agenda of somebody else i'm like this is my one opportunity i i am taking the stage i am putting this out in my voice and uh, doing it for me but doing it for other people who can who can pick it up and and run with it so, it's such a great point, isn't it? Because I, I remember after I left corporate about, I don't know how long it was now, <laughs> seven, eight years ago, uh, the first time I sort of put out a tweet, I was at a conference and I was commenting on something. And I remember that kind of mental check in is this okay? Is this I was like, oh, it's just me. I can say whatever I like. Uh, and it was, it was a real frisson, but quite scary. Well, what do I think, actually? <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's funny because once you do that, once you get over that ledge, it's like, what else could I do? Yeah. And then it just opens up so many possibilities. And yeah, for me, it was very liberating, but also, as you mentioned, very vulnerable and scary because now I'm taking this very raw word baby that I have spent months creating and now I'm handing it to a copy editor whose job it is to redline and tough but fair feedback and question some of the things that I've done. And I'm like, it's going to be painful, but at the end, it's a better product. And even that is a conversation, right? Because it's just one person's suggestion about what they think based on their life experience. 
and then taking that feedback and saying, okay, but this is why I structured it that way. And it just, it, yeah, it ended up being an amazing experience. I wouldn't have changed it for anything. That That's really heartening. And I have to say, you know, publishing has got its own diversity issues. <laughs> There's all sorts of reasons behind that. But typically, the chain of people who were looking at your text tend not to be the most diverse set in the world. So it's, it's mm-hmm. interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and can I, this is a bit of a segue, but can I be honest, can I share a story? Yeah, so, I do. What, one of the reasons that I, I, I started focusing more on the content review and things like that and, and inclusivity reads and sensitivity reads is because in an earlier version of my book, I had a copy editor go through and every time I said they or them, the copy editor actually changed it to he and she. Yeah. And I old fashioned grammar that. meets 21st mm-hmm. century, century sensibilities. Mm-hmm. How, yeah, yeah, it, it says it all, doesn't it? Yeah, and it wasn't from a place of malice, it wasn't from a oh, oh we, we have to have a gender binary in your book. It's like, no, they didn't know, they thought it was improper grammar and just yeah. forced to have it. That muscle memory changed it, and it one created an opportunity for me to say, okay, well, I really need to evaluate this, but also the lack of diversity and understanding in the editing industry. And the publishing industry was just... And you're, yeah, it, it is. It's, it's shocking. And, and sensitivity reads has become much more of a thing, uh, which is which is really good. But it, I mean, you'd like to think it wouldn't be necessary because actually people would take it on board. It's, it's like having a diversity officer, isn't it? Rather than it being um, really ingrained in people's DNA. But it's it's going to take a while, I think. It's going to take a while. And, 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 and people just calling it out when they see it. Like, okay, you're writing a... You're writing case studies, but all of your case studies are are white humans from North America or U.S. or Canada. So I'm sure there's people in other regions and other parts of the world that are doing amazing research. But if it's not getting cited, it's not getting visible. Yeah. And I think as an author, you do have a responsibility, don't you? You have a platform and you have privilege and you know, use it. Use it well. Use it you know, wisely and, and fairly. Um, yeah. Uh, that's really interesting. I want to ask you very briefly about systems as well. Sorry, this is not at all ideological. I'm just always interested. <laughs> when you write, when you research, what's your kind of best tools and systems? Are there any sort of things that you do? Are you a records, cards kind of girl or are you Trello? Or, you know, what do you use? I So I use a combination. Uh, it took me a long time to stop using Microsoft Project. Um, just because that's what I came up with and that was it, but it, that's such a very linear structure, right? And so really for me, it's a combination of, I do, I do like Trello. I, I like the visual representation of that, but honestly, I have four whiteboards in my office and I color coded post-it notes and, and all these, you know, Sharpies everywhere. And, and that's how I mentally map things out. Because for me, it's like, it's not, it's not necessarily, and having, I'm sure you've experienced something similar, having gone through the writing processes, that it's not a linear, it's, it's, you have an idea here, and maybe you realize, no, this actually needs to go over here. And so having something tangible that I can touch and move and see, that's, that's my, that's my happy place. Yeah, that, that's so interesting, that, that, I, that kinesthetic idea of having something physical that you're working with and be able to map ideas out. I, I've got a big table next to me at the moment with all, all the stuff on, but um, I can't remember who it was, but I was reading a book the other day that said, um, you know, that how you, the, the author was kind of laughing hollowly at the kind of the myth that people have that you can just kind of sequester yourself away in a, in a cafe with a notebook in a corner. And she's like, you need a conference table to write a book. Yes. Guys, you've got to put it all out there. <laughs> it's so you true. Did, yes, yes. No, yeah, it's really great, great, but you still need some, there's something about the physicality of, of having it on a wall or a whiteboard or a table, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Actually, one of my friends is a huge book geek and she will use um, eBooks, Kindles, things like that. But she, it throws her off because I don't, she says, I don't know how far I am in the book. Yeah. I don't have that sense of, oh, I'm getting to the end. It's going to be good. It's only this many pages. How are they going to wrap this all together? Because you're just scrolling. And yeah, it's got the percentage at the bottom. But yeah. Yeah. And suddenly at the end, I, and you're like, no, 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 I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So true, isn't it? Mind you, that almost never happens in the business book still. <laughs> yeah, no, I, always, <laughs> I always ask people, Jen, for their best tips. So if there's a first time author listening, if they're still mired in the early stages, what would you say to them? Just start writing. Just start writing. Just, I I don't know how many times I, I felt myself like, who am I to write a book? One. And then I would write a, a section that I thought was really good. 
And then I read another section and a series of articles started coming together. And I, I was talking to a colleague and I'm like, I, I just can't do this. And they said, you're already doing it. You're doing it right now. It's just not organized in a linear chapter with the table of contents and reference section. And so my advice is just sit down and write, even if it's just for you. And I think you'd be surprised how quickly you see themes emerge and ideas come together. And pretty soon you're connecting concepts that seem totally unrelated in, in a way that is really going to be fantastic for the reader. That's it's such great advice. And that sense that actually, you know, I can't do it. You're doing it. If you're writing, mm -hmm. it's you're material. It. Exactly. And, and you can build on that. But if you're not writing at all, then you got nothing. Yeah. Great tip. Beautifully put. I hope you're listening, everybody. And uh, would you also like to recommend for us um, a business book that's particularly uh, impressed you or you think it's a particularly good example of its kind? I I am blanking on, I've lost the author's name, but it was, uh, I, I listened to an audiobook when I was doing some heavy road trips over at the last month. Uh, it's called Do the Work. Yeah. And I, I became so... I, I wish I could remember the author's name. It's totally blanking, but um, a Scottish person, and just the approach was so raw and so humaning, and just so anyway. So I became. Oh, I'm thinking of Stephen Pressfield, but do you mean Stephen Pressfield? No, it's like a, it's like a Gary. Hmm. He also has a book out. I, I became obsessed with his approach, and so I started listening to all his other books. And one is um, "Unf Yourself." And so maybe we're kindred spirits and maybe that's why I was drawn to the work, but it, his work, but it was so just real about getting out of your own way, getting out of your own head and then practical advice and guidance on getting to the place that you really want to be and being really intentional about what you want to do with your life and make it good. Brilliant. See, I'm going to have to do the research now and come up with this, but <laughs> I've got <laughs> Gary John Bishop. Um, Gary John Bishop, yes. That's the chap, yes. is it? Yes. And uh, does, does the audio for his audiobooks as well. And it's just, if you find yourself driving two days through the desert in the middle of nowhere, highly recommend. Just well, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> I can't imagine I'm going to find I'm sure it applies other ways as well, but that's just my image. It's good. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. And Jen, if people want to find out more about you, more about Inclusive AF, more about the work that you do, where should they go? Uh, so Inclusive AF is available globally and it is on your favorite online retail um, platform. Or even your least favorite. <laughs> yeah, even your least favorite on all of them. I was, so I, it's a bit of a segue. I, I grew up in Seattle. And so uh, one of our big local bookstores in Portland, Oregon, has my book available online and I actually took a snapshot of it and sent it to my dad and I'm like literally this is I I am done here I'm gonna I can die here. happy right yes exactly um so back to the original question yeah so it is available online um paper book if you like making notes in the margin or obviously ebooks as well and um, you can find more about me double talk consulting or uh paging dr jen Paging Dr. Jen. Brilliant. That is like my that. that is my uh, Instagram social media handles and also the web page. Love that. Brilliant. Well, I'll put those links up on the show notes at extraordinarybusinessbooks.com along with the transcript of this so that you can uh, you can read. There's so much good stuff there. And thank you so much for your time today, Jen. It's an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for having me. This is this has been great. Bye.